I first came to this island in November 1958 as a schoolboy. At that time, I could never possibly have imagined what lay ahead of me. Because on the 4th of January 1960, I started work on this very spot as an apprenticeship draftsman and began to study naval architecture part-time at the University of New South Wales. It's a fascinating place to have worked in. At those times, we were building ships, we were refitting ships. Uh, and always with the love of ships, I was able to indulge that interest. I worked up my way through the structure of COP2 quite quickly. Uh, and uh, in 1981, uh, I was appointed Managing Director and Chief Executive. Unfortunately, it became my duty also to close the place down, which was no fun. Uh, but I'm extremely proud of the fact that I was able to spend 32 years in this remarkable place, uh, working on important, interesting work with an extraordinary range of wonderful people. When people who know something about this place think of Cockatoo Island, they often think about the shipbuilding activity and the ship repair activity. But Cockatoo had a much wider involvement in industry and in the development of Australia than that. At the moment, I'm sitting in the biggest workshop on the island, the turbine shop. At the beginning of World War II, this whole area was solid rock. But this was excavated during the war to enable the dockyard to build steam turbines for warships, uh, reciprocating machinery for cargo ships and things like that, um, for ships being built on Cockatoo Island and by other shipbuilders throughout Australia who had been revitalised in the early years of World War II. Following World War II, um, there was still engine manufacture here. The last steam turbines that were built on Cockatoo Island were built for the frigates Torrens and Swan in the 1960s. But after that, this place was a hive of activity, repairing and restoring and maintaining very large steam turbine and other rotating machinery equipment uh, for users throughout Australia, New Zealand and the Southwest Pacific. It was a very busy engineering shop. Cockatoo's engineering works were in many ways just as impressive as uh, the shipbuilding works. In the 1840s, there was a serious need for docking facilities in this part of the world for ships of the Royal Navy. And the New South Wales government proposed uh, to London that a dock be built in Sydney and that the Admiralty might like to contribute to the cost. The Admiralty declined, uh, but the site chosen to build the dock was here on Cockatoo Island. Now, an island is not a good place for any industrial establishment, really, but uh, there was a labour force and the Commonwealth, and the government, rather, the New South Wales government owned the site. Um, so the convicts set forth to build the Fitzroy Dock. Um, it was too small by the 1870s, and another dock, the Southern Dock, was built uh, to the west of the Fitzroy Dock. Well, Cockatoo Dockyard made a major contribution over 134 years, not only in the maritime field, in the maintenance of ships and buildings, tugs and bridges and things like that. But in the development of the Royal Australian Navy, the support of the Royal Australian Navy, the support of the navies and of the Allies during the World Wars. In, in 1942-43, this was the main ship repair base in the Southwest Pacific. But in addition to all that nautical activity and maritime activity, the dockyard built parts of bridges, dams, parts of the Snowy Mountain Scheme, parts of power stations, but the biggest legacy, I suspect, of the dockyard was people, because um, we employed thousands of people. In my time, we peaked at 2,650 employees, which included 410 apprentices, because we trained many of the people that worked on the work here at COP2, and that was the best way to get the skills we needed. A lot of them left, of course, and went elsewhere, uh, but it was one of the major legacies for thousands of people who were trained in the wide variety of work that this dockyard undertook throughout its time um, and went on to help build industry in Australia. It was a special place to work uh, and I think one of the reasons for that was that the workload here was so varied. We did so many different things. There wasn't much we couldn't do. And when, until the later years, when we made, relied much more on subcontractors, when we were building a ship, we didn't only just build the ship, 
We built the machinery, the turbines, the boilers. Uh, we built the doors, we built the kit lockers, we built the bunks, we built the furniture. We did everything. We did a lot of that work. It was highly rewarding. When you came to work on a Monday morning at COP2, you really had no firm idea about what was going to happen. Sadly, when we closed Cockatoo Dockyard down, much of the dockyard was stripped, a lot of machinery and equipment was sold, and a lot of buildings were destroyed and removed. So you cannot now get a complete feel for what the dockyard was like when it was working. At the moment, uh, I'm sitting in the turbine shop, uh, one of the big engineering workshops, and quite a few of these engineering workshops remain. Some, including some of the machine tools, which date from the early part of the 20th century, uh, but the shipbuilding facilities have largely gone, except for two slipways in, on the northern side of the island, number one and number two shipbuilding slips. And you can get some impression of the size of those slipways from that. But uh, today, uh, it's a different place. It still has uh, the record of the history. It is still here. It's very well recorded, so if people are interested in finding more out about Cockatoo, there's plenty to find. Um, but uh, I have to be honest, in an industrial sense, it's a shadow of its former self.